For a number of years now, the expansion of development up Burke Mountain has been a hot-button topic here in the Tri-Cities, as the growth in population has far surpassed that of the public amenities. On Tuesday, August 30th, civic officials, school district 43 representatives, and the media came out to Smiling Creek Elementary School in Coquitlam to hear an announcement made by Premier John Horgan that demonstrates that the province has been listening to concerns expressed by council and residents living in the area. Tri-Cities Community TV was there and brings you this coverage. All right, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to celebrate the uh, exciting improvements happening in Coquitlam School District. I am very excited. In fact, I'm thrilled to be here today as the host MLA uh, for Coquitlam Burke Mountain and your MC for today's event. So this is a very exciting announcement, uh, one we've been waiting for for quite some time. So I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Coquitlam First Nation, uh, which lies in the shared traditional territories of the Coast Salish Nations. And to get uh, us started in a good way, uh, please join me in welcoming Chief Ed Hall from the Coquitlam Nation. Chief Ed Hall. Thanks, go see um, Finn Donnelly. Thanks, well, he is up by all. See, I'm Scapelum Ed Hall, Tunnisqui, Leitonach, Coquitlam, Tomach. I see him to see it's eaten often, he marked it in a mess up, what wheel him here, Tunnock, to put him summer, he swap old Tunnock, Smiling Creek Elementary, or Coquitlam, Coquitlam. Good day, how are you all? Chief Ed of Hall, my English names, and uh, Scott Halem is my traditional ancestral name. And I just wanted to give you the traditional welcome in my endangered language words, which I've been actually a part of uh, revitalization, uh, you know, in the last seven years. Uh, so there's a few of us that actually use it, but we're not uh, fluent in it yet, but uh, we're working on it. So I wanted to say uh, honored friends, relatives, visitors, colleagues, uh, the, everyone, welcome to the ancestral and the lands of the Quiquicum people, and in particular, the location of Smiling Creek Elementary. And uh, I just wanted to say uh, I acknowledge uh, everyone's here, uh, the Premier, uh, the, the MLAs, the, the people of the school district uh, representation, and uh, the teachers, the students. Uh, it's nice to see you all. A great, great, lovely audience here. And I just wanted to uh, raise my hands and uh, say welcome and hi, Sapka. Thank you all. Thank you, Chief Ed Hall, uh, for that wonderful welcome and for starting us off in a good way. So I want to take a moment to introduce our speakers for today's event. We are very excited and pleased to have the Premier, John Horgan, here. We have Jennifer Whiteside, the Minister of Education. It says and child care, so I better add that, and child care. Um, and we have uh, Michael Thomas, who's the board chair, School District 43. And we have Atash uh, Askarian, who's the PAC, or the Parent Advisory Committee Chair for uh, Coast Salish Elementary here. And you met Chief Ed Hall. We, we also, and I'd like to acknowledge a number of other uh, elected officials in the audience. We have uh, the Mayor of Coquitlam, Richard Stewart. We have uh, Coquitlam City Councilors, uh, Craig Hodge, uh, Chris Wilson, Brent Asmussen, Trish Mandewa, and Terry Towner. We have four Coquitlam City Councilors, Glenn Pollock and Christine McCurrick. Oh, sorry, Nancy McCurrick. Sorry, Nancy. There, there we are. There, Nancy. Um, we have Coquitlam School Board Trustees uh, Jennifer Blatherwick, uh, Craig Woods, Carol Cahoon, and Barb Hobson. 
And we have Port Coquitlam School Board Trustee Christine Pollock. I hope I haven't missed anyone. That's always the nerve-wracking thing of uh, listing elected officials. But uh, we're thrilled to have you all, elected officials, uh, the students, the parents, uh, the school administration, all of the staff that have made today's event possible and, and this announcement. So I know this investment will bring families in the area peace of mind that there will be seats available at schools close to home as the community continues to grow. And I would now like to welcome uh, the Premier of the province to uh, start us off in a good way and say a few words. Uh, thank you, Finn, and uh, thank you, Chief Hall, uh, High School CM, uh, for allowing us here on the traditional territory of Kirkland First Nation. It is uh, not the aerial view for uh, tonight's television. We we're going to get a drone, but it was nicer to have a small plane fly by. Uh, it is uh, great to be back at Smiling Creek Elementary. I was here a few years ago for the opening of this great school to announce the construction of Coast Salish. Uh, school, which uh, Atash will tell us about uh, in a few moments, and I'm very excited today to be back in the Tri-Cities to talk about a recently completed uh, rebuild at Urban Elementary in Poco. Uh, for those Poco councillors that are here, this was again a, a level of collaboration that has been unprecedented. Uh, the school district, uh, municipal councillors in the province working together with parents, with PACs, and making sure the kids were at the center of the planning that we do. Irvine will have a, learn, a, a neighborhood learning center and will host 500 students. Uh, that is a significant improvement in uh, the status quo, and we have much, much more to do. Over a quarter of a billion dollars has been invested in schools here in the Tri-Cities area, and we have more to go. Uh, certainly, uh, it is uh, important when we think about the development of Perk Mountain, and I know uh, Mayor Stewart and the council here are constantly trying to find innovative ways to work with other orders of government to ensure that we're maximizing the services we're providing to people as we grow our great communities here in the Lower Mainland and indeed across the province. But I lift my hands to uh, both POCO and Coquitlam councils as well as um, a school board, and Michael, will, of course, can speak for himself, but a school board that has been managing growth. Uh, I, I come from a high-growth district, Surrey, just around the corner, another high-growth district. And so we have to have different plans and different strategies for different parts of the province. But it is always great to be here. And, of course, the top priority for the school district has been addressing the shortage of spaces on Burke Mountain. And I want uh, everyone here to know that we heard you loudly and clearly. Um, MLA uh, Donnelly, uh, MLA's uh, Robinson and Farnworth, who are not with us today, uh, are also uh, always in my ear and in the ear of their colleagues. And as a result, we're proud to announce an $135 million investment in 1,000 student spaces starting from, K or from 6 to grade 12 here on Burke Mountain to fulfill the commitment that we made some years ago. And of course, not just building a commitment, but meeting the expectations of the people who've come to the, this dynamic community expecting to have the services that they deserve. And a $135 million secondary school that will start as a middle and secondary school with the middle school being built beside it again in collaboration with the uh, Coquitlam Council is very exciting for the people in the region. It's very exciting for the province. When you have partners that are focused on the same issues you are, it's easy to get things done. And I know that uh, it, I'm now five years as Premier, uh, been to Coquitlam several times, uh, a number of schools, and we still have more work to do. So I'm going to leave the discussion of the more work to do to my colleague, uh, uh, Minister uh, Whiteside. But it is just a, a real thrill to be back here. Uh, I don't think it's the same kids behind me as were here before. They've all moved on, and they will be going to a new high school on Burke Mountain uh, by 2026. Construction will begin next year, $135 million committed, $25 million from the school district to supplement that. Again, a level of collaboration that's unprecedented, but I believe is the model that we need to have, not just in high growth areas, but in every part of the province. So for, for those who are here, thank you very much. Thank you for the clap. Thank you, Premier, and thanks again for uh, being here with us today on this exciting day. As you know, I have long advocated for middle and secondary school in Burke Mountain area, and I am thrilled to see this project finally come to fruition. 
So I would now like to welcome Jennifer Whiteside, Minister of Education and Child Care, up to say a few words and tell us a bit more about this exciting project. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, uh, Finn, for the introduction. Uh, I can attest that Finn is a, is a fierce advocate for, for your community. We've had many conversations about this wonderful news that we're announcing today. And I want to thank uh, Chief Hall very much for starting us off in a good way today. Any day that we hear Indigenous languages spoken and hear life in Indigenous languages is a very good day, and I deeply appreciate hearing those words this morning. Thank you. It is great to be here uh, today on the territories of the uh, Quiquitlam First Nation and we thank the Quiquitlam who continue to live on these lands and care for them along with the waters and all that is above and below. And it's such a pleasure to join you as Minister of Education and Child Care to celebrate the upcoming start of the school year and the funding for the new Burke Mountain School. And I will just add my voice to uh, the gratitude to all who have joined us today from all of our different communities. But in particular, I just want to say to all of the kids and the parents here, thank you so much for coming out. And you know, you are all being so patient, super patient while we do this, and I really thank you for that. Uh, we're, 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 we'll get through as quickly as we can, so you can go back to playing and doing all the important things that you, that you do. Um, I also want to say a very special thank you to all of the teachers, the school staff, administrators, and uh, administrators and district staff who are working really hard this week to prepare for the return to school uh, next week. I thank you for continuing to provide Coquitlam children and youth with the excellent educational programming that Coquitlam schools are known for. Uh, we know that the Burke Mountain region is a wonderful place to raise a family and we know that this school has been a long time coming. So we're so pleased to announce the $135 million investment that we are making uh, in, in this school. We know, and you all know, that at the heart of every great community is a, one, is a fabulous school filled with wonderful educators and staff who support students on their educational journey. This new school will benefit the broader community with a neighborhood learning center that will be used for recreational programming. The school design will include measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions throughout the building's lifetime. It will have gender neutral and accessible washrooms and elevators and parking for those uh, among us with mobility challenges. All of this aligns with our government's goals of creating safe and inclusive learning environments for children across BC. We look forward to construction starting in 2023 and to students being in classrooms in 2026. It is a top priority for our government to work with school districts to meet enrollment growth in communities such as, uh, such as Coquitlam and to ensure parents know that their kids have a place at a school that is close to home. So we're proud of the work that we've done in Coquitlam with our partners to invest in new and expanded schools and really our partnership with the, with the school district is, uh, is, is, uh, is very, very strong and delivers on projects uh, as does our, our relationship, uh, the relationship with, with the city. And thank you to the city for your partnership on this project. Our government continues to invest in Coquitlam including $24.3 million for the replacement and expansion of Irvine Elementary which is ready to welcome students back this September. And as you heard earlier, the replacement school is not only safer and bigger with an increased capacity, but it also includes a neighborhood learning center that received $2.4 million in funding from Child Care BC's New Spaces Fund. So this center will provide both before and after school care, as well as infant and toddler care to further support families in the Burke Mountain area. We've also invested over 20 million for additions at Panorama Heights Elementary, Westwood Elementary, and Charles Best Secondary. These recently completed projects add almost 400 new seats to the district. And we've made a $32.2 million investment for the seismic replacement and 115 seat expansion at Moody Elementary. All of this is incredible work uh, in an incredibly dynamic uh, uh, community and I want to thank everyone involved in moving to work, move, working to move us forward to create modern, inspiring and safe schools uh, in this district and across the province. 
And as we look to the start of the 2022-2023 school year, I want to confirm uh, and reaffirm for all of you our government's commitment to support students and their future by investing in schools. In the last four years, we've invested $2.8 billion in new and expanded schools, seismic upgrades, land purchases for future schools, and there is more to come. Over the next three years, we will be investing a historic amount, $3.1 billion in K-12 schools. We've just announced also $60 million of additional funding to help families deal right now, today, with current challenges they're experiencing due to global inf inflation. Our 60 million student and family affordability fund will be used by school districts to expand school food and meal programs, to reduce additional cost to parents for things like uh, field trips and school supplies. We're committed to continuing this work uh, with school districts, with all of our partners across uh, the education uh, system. And finally, I just I want to really acknowledge all of the extraordinary work of all educators, educational assistants, our bus drivers, our admin staff, cleaners, the principals and vice principals, superintendents, trustees, First Nations advocates, all of our education partners who work so hard to provide British Columbia's children and youth with fulfilling educational experiences and who support their growth and development. I wish, uh, we all wish uh, students and families and teachers a very happy and successful start to the school year. Thanks so much again for having me out. Uh, thank you so much, Minister Whiteside. It's uh, wonderful to hear about the investments our government is making that benefit Coquitlam students and families. The school uh, project, this school project wouldn't have been possible without the determination and the dedication of School District 43. Uh, so now please uh, join me in welcoming Michael Thomas, the chair of the Coquitlam Board of Education to the podium to say a few words about their involvement in this, these projects. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. And thank you to the Premier, Minister of Education, Chief Ed Hall, and all of you. But most especially, thank you to our students for joining us here today. My name is Michael Thomas, and I am Chair of the Board of Education for School District 43. The SD43 Board of Education has been advocating for a Burke Mountain Middle Secondary School for a long time. And it's very exciting to see this project moving forward here today. The funding from the Ministry of Education and Child Care, along with financial support from School District 43, will ensure that the education needs of students are met in this region for many years to come. Building safe and modern schools and ensuring students have the resources they need for a quality education remains amongst our board's top priorities. So we are very excited for the opening of the upcoming Coast Salish Elementary, a new K-5 school in this neighborhood that is very close to completion, and for the recently completed seismic replacement of Irvin Elementary, just down the road from here. And we're excited as they welcome students next week. The Burke Mountain neighborhood has been growing quickly, and it has long been a priority of the SD43 board and district leadership team, many of whom have joined us here today to address the needs of families and children in our community. And we are grateful for the funding announcement to support building these schools and are thankful for the positive partnerships we have with the government of BC, the Ministry of Education and Child Care, as well as the terrific relationships we have with our municipal partners. We're lucky to be joined here today with councillors uh, from both Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam, a testament to their hard work and dedication in assisting us in advocating for these schools. And we very much appreciate the partnership in particular uh, here on Burke Mountain with uh, the city of Coquitlam, uh, who has been instrumental uh, with all of our projects up here in fast tracking, and they'll be contributing a wonderful new turf field to our school site. Uh, thank you, everyone. I certainly do appreciate the ta you taking the time to be with us here today as we continue to work together for our students, because everything we do, we do for our students. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Board Chair uh, Michael Thomas. And uh, you know, you mentioned uh, partnerships, uh, and and that is what this project is about. You and your trustees have shown in collaborating on this challenging project. So this this project is definitely about partnerships, and another uh, strong partner in making this uh, happen were the parents. So how about giving those Burke Mountain parents a round of applause? And, and I'd like to give one special shout out to uh, a parent in particular, Isabel Sylvester, who kept me honest through this entire process. So I, I wanna give her a special shout out, but I know there are so many parents and she has been uh, quick to say how many other parents have been involved in making this project a reality. So I would now like to ask on behalf of parents, students, and uh, others in the, in the community, uh, ask Atash Askarian, the, the PAC chair uh, for Coast Salish Elementary to share a few words about partnerships in this project. Everyone, I wanted to start by saying thank you to Chief Paul for his um, announce, or presentation earlier. Um, and I wanted to just say thank you to the parents who truly fought for this school and the elementary schools even that are on this mountain. As a parent who has had to commute one way, 30 minutes back and forth, and then that's twice a day to get my kids to school off the mountain, this is great. Coast Salish will be a walk away. My kids will be able to walk to school. They will, we will be able to build our family within this community. And having a high school up here will also allow us to have that continuation and growth here. I know it is so difficult for a lot of parents and I see it in the Facebook groups where they talk every year at the beginning of the school year. How do we get our kids to the middle school? How do we make sure that our kids safely go to the high school? And with the school on this mountain, they won't have to worry about that. They can just drive up, pick up their kids, drop them off on their way to work, or just have them walk. And that is so amazing. So having that happen and become a reality is wonderful for this community and it will help us grow even more and to build that unity within um, our schools and have Brook Mountain just be as prosperous as it was promised it would be. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Atash. Uh, it's great to hear how the work of our government is, uh, or what, what we're doing to improve uh, schools and uh, is benefiting families in the Burke Mountain region. Uh, so in conclusion, this uh, brings us near uh, the end. We still have uh, one thing to do, or a couple of things to do with uh, talk to the media, answer a few questions. Uh, we want to get a group photo at the end, but I want to thank uh, all of our esteemed speakers who joined us here today. Uh, this has been a great way uh, to get us ready for the start of the school year, 2022-23. I really want to acknowledge the Premier for being here at this announcement. I know this is going to be one of his last, and I think it's just incredible that uh, he was able to come and join us as Premier. Uh, to to uh, be with us in this project. And I know when I stood up in uh, 2020 to announce alongside with the Premier this school, it's been on my mind and, I, and he has been a true champion as well uh, for making this happen. So it's been a real pleasure to work with you, Premier. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to acknowledge the Tri-City MLAs, as the Premier did, uh, who were also uh, fierce uh, advocates for this project. Minister Robinson, uh, Minister Farnworth, MLA Glumack, uh, myself, have all met with the school district over many years in the city uh, to talk about how we can get this uh, project finally to this day. Uh, the school board trustees, uh, you heard from uh, Chair Thomas uh, and his team, the district staff, have been incredible. Um, Minister Whiteside and her team. Uh, I don't think since I was elected, I let her uh, I let her alone for a day. I was I was always talking to her, and she was always very receptive uh, about this project. And I really appreciate her and her team and the work they did. Uh, as well, the Burke Mountain parents, uh, the students that this will benefit. Thank you. And I just want to give a special shout out to my staff 
Caitlin and Linda, who have also uh, done a tremendous amount of work on this project. So I'd, I'd like to call up uh, our speakers uh, and answer questions uh, by, from the media. And then after, we'll have a photo shoot. And I'm not sure who, oh, okay, we're gonna uh, have the Premier who will uh, moderate the questions. Premier. Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Finn. And just before we get started, um, Michael and, and, and uh, Jennifer and, and Finn and I talked about the how, the collaboration, but it was great to have Atash talk about the why. The why is for the families who come to a community with an expectation that the services that they need are going to be there for them. So thank you, Atash, for reminding us. And, and as uh, Michael has said, we're, we're kid-centered here because we want to have schools that are the best they could possibly be for our youngsters. But youngsters are part of families, and families need to have confidence that they can live full and free lives and put down roots. So Atash has brought it all home for us. The, the why is in, in her words, the how was the rest of us. And with that, uh, uh, before we begin, I know, I guess I'll just let Lindsay take it from there. I'll stop talking for a brief moment. Thank you, Premier. Uh, we have media on site with us today, and we have a mic over here with Rick. If you have any questions, please come over and identify yourself. Before we do that, though, we do have media on the phone line. If you wish to ask a question on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. Everybody's limited to one question and one follow us. Go ahead. Aaron MacArthur, Global News. Uh, it looks like the BCGU and the employer are close to a deal. They stood down picket lines, ended the overtime ban. Are you frustrated it's taken this long to get to at least what looks like a deal? Well, uh, the actually, I, of a deal, sorry? I have to say that frustration wasn't uh, the word that came to my mind when I was uh, briefed this morning on uh, events at the bargaining table. Quite the opposite. Uh, relief, uh, satisfaction that collective bargaining can work. Uh, we need to... Uh, address and understand the changes in our economy uh, that have happened as a result of COVID, as a result of uh, unprecedented uh, supply chain issues. We heard that word used once or twice uh, in the, this morning. So there is a, a transformation in our economic well-being and that, that is felt, of course, by working families. So I'm, I'm delighted that uh, we appear to have reached a tentative agreement. Uh, the picket lines are coming down. That's great news for the hospitality sector particularly but it's also uh, good news for all British Columbians. And uh, this will be the beginning of uh, a template for further negotiations with other critical employees uh, that service uh, British Columbians, nurses, uh, teachers, uh, uh, support staff, all of the other public sector workers that are so important to us. And, and that was highlighted through COVID-19. Uh, what we did want to depend on through those unprecedented times was public services delivered by our neighbors and our friends and our family. And so I'm, I wouldn't say frustration, uh, Aaron, I would say relief and satisfaction that collective bargaining is the best way forward. Uh, we live in a country where uh, free collective bargaining has served all of us from coast to coast to coast for generations and it continues to do so. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, um, public accounts show a surplus last fiscal. There's still a lot of talks to come, as you say. Yeah. Does it? Do you run the risk of, of the other negotiations being rockier? Are unions holding to their demands? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, obviously, I, and I don't know if the public accounts announcement has happened, or are you just uh, leaving me on there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll leave that. But you're, you're right. Uh, it, our public accounts will show a surplus uh, in the previous year. Uh, that was unanticipated. Uh, we have uh, the Minister of Finance uh, in Ottawa announcing a $10 billion surplus in the first quarter of 2022-2023, uh, just, just last week. So the finances of our uh, orders of government are in relatively good shape, and it's largely, and the, the data will come out uh, with Minister Robinson later today, but it's largely because of uh, how dynamic and robust the BC economy has been. None of us could have predicted coming out of COVID that we would have had such a huge bounce. Uh, and of course, the biggest challenge with that, and it's in every sector, is finding people to do the work that's needed. We've seen that in construction, we've seen it in hospitality, we've seen it in healthcare. So um, I think that I take comfort in the fact that our uh, finances are in good shape. That was one of the issues that I focused on when I uh, came to government five years ago, and I'm delighted to that we'll have a balanced budget in the year just finished, and uh, I'm confident that we'll continue to be on track to do the best we can to balance the budget going forward. Penny? Hi, 
Premier uh, Penny Daflos from CTV News. Uh, until a short time ago, uh, we had a strike affecting the entire hospitality industry. The ambulance crisis has reached new levels. Uh, people are still hospitalized and dying from COVID each week, but we never really talk about it. Um, I know it's summertime, but you haven't been around much. We haven't seen very much of your ministers, and yet there's so much going on, and I think people are just wondering, who's driving the bus right now? Well, I'm driving the bus. That's why I'm standing here answering your questions. Uh, we've been working all summer long. Uh, you don't have to be in front of a camera to do the good work uh, of government. Uh, I believe that our job is to administer the public good. And that's not glamorous work. It's not uh, work that requires uh, media briefings at all times. You've highlighted a number of crises and challenges we face, and I've acknowledged those not just today, but in previous engagements with the media and with the public. Uh, but the only way we get out of this, as we, uh, I said in my earlier remarks, is by collaborating and working together. On the health care front, I uh, continue to maintain with other premiers across the country. I continue to be the chair of the Council of the Federation. We need the federal government to join us. I'm not pointing a finger when I say that. I want to be clear. We need to have a revisiting of our public health care system. We can't do it in component parts. We have to do it together. That will affect ambulance services. That will affect uh, human resource development in our acute care systems. We've made a breakthrough with the doctors of BC. Very excited to stand uh, shoulder to shoulder with them on a, on a bridging uh, funding to get us into a, a broader discussion for next year's budget. So I, I think there's lots of positive things going on, Penny. Uh, if uh, I haven't been available to you, I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, I did take a break, uh, married my youngest, uh, oldest son. Uh, it was a lovely ceremony, thanks for asking. And uh, <laughs> caught a couple of fish in Fort Renfrew on the weekend. But I'm back to work and I'll continue to work until a replacement is selected. Follow up, Penny? I do. Uh, and I'm glad you brought up health care because that's uh, my second question for you. Your government seems to be increasingly comfortable with the private delivery of health care services. The Ministry of Health provided me with information showing that uh, private surgical centers are providing more surgeries year over year. Uh, the uh, health authorities have also given me data that these agency nurses, I mean, these companies are making millions and millions of dollars. There's a, an increasing reliance on it. So I know that it's, it's technically allowed because it's public funding, but these for-profit companies are now starting to get increasingly involved in delivery of health care. So um, I just, you know, this has really happened under your watch, so I'm just wondering why you've allowed the private delivery of these health care services. Well, that's, a, that's inaccurate. It didn't happen on our watch. Uh, workers' compensation, for example, has been utilizing private services to uh, get workers back to work and shorten the time of uh, compensation. That's been going on for decades. So it didn't just happen last week. Uh, I know that Minister Dix, uh, having answered a similar question to that uh, last week, was unequivocal that, uh, and I uh, su support that view, that our government does not support the expansion of for-profit delivery of health care. Quite the contrary, and that's why we're doubling down on our efforts to work with our partners in the, uh, in the professions, whether it be uh, the BCNU, doctors of BC, the hospital employees union, as well as the federal government, so that we can ensure that the public who want to access these services and get the quality care that they need are getting that. And, and it's not, uh, I, I think it would be um, disrespectful of me to say that, uh, that I have all the answers to these problems, because I don't. But their answers are out there, and what we've been doing is engaging with people, whether they be providing services or whether they've been trying to access services, so that we can build out a public system that works for everybody. Uh, is there the provision of uh, surgical procedures uh, that are being uh, provided by for-profit uh, corporations? Yes, there are. But it has not expanded significantly, as, as my understanding, uh, nor is it something that just began five years ago. Are there any more questions on site? Go ahead. Hello, uh, Kyle Balzer with the Tri-City News. I have questions, I guess, for either Michael or Finn, depending on who could best answer this. I'm um, curious about the 1,000 number of spaces for the new middle secondary school. Uh, was more spaces uh, potentially discussed? Uh, how did that number come to the final uh, decision? And is that enough, considering that Coquitlam itself is going to grow by thousands in the next decade? Is 1,000 enough for only one neighborhood uh, high school? Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I do know that the uh, school is being designed with an expanded uh, core so that the building could be expanded in the future and facilitate additional seats uh, within the secondary portion. And as you likely know, the, the plan is to build a full-fledged middle school down the road uh, on the same site. So we will, within the same uh, uh, 
project within the same site will have both a full secondary school as well as a full middle school down the road. So just to clarify, does that bill come after the secondary school is yes. complete? Okay. So when was that expected? The original school will be built as a joint middle and secondary school. And then once we have funding, we'll get going on the middle school. And uh, hopefully within a couple of years, uh, you know, Ben, Master, <laughs> Premier, uh, we certainly will want to get started on that project as quickly as we can to continue to meet enrollment uh, pressures in this area. Thank you. And with uh, completion expected for 2026 on that uh, uh, secondary school, I guess what can be said to parents right now, uh, I cash attested to it that she has to drive 30 minutes herself, and then obviously once it's complete, it'll be a shorter commute. But between then and now, what can you say to parents now who might still be you know, frustrated with the fact that they may have, to have long commutes uh, or limited number of spaces for that matter for their kids? So I, I can appreciate that challenge. My, my own children attend Terry Fox uh, Secondary School, and I live just on the Port Coquitlam side of the, the border. And so I'm, I'm driving down Coast Meridian every morning getting my kids to and from school too. So I can certainly appreciate that challenge. What I do know is that we continue to work collaboratively both with the Ministry of Education and the City of Coquitlam, City of Port Coquitlam, uh, to improve access for our students. And uh, we'll continue to work towards uh, building new schools as quickly as possible to meet demand. We're gonna go to the phone lines now. First question, Katie DeRosa, Vancouver Sun. Hi, Premier. Uh, congratulations on your son's wedding. That, that, that sounds you. lovely. Um, I'm wondering, with all, if this is setting the benchmark for the other 400,000 public sector workers, how, how much is, is that expected to cost uh, the government? What, what does that mean for, for our budget going forward? Well, thank you for the question. It is uh, premature for me to discuss uh, the elements of the package uh, that's being. Uh, uh, worked on at the bargaining table. I know there's some non-financial items that uh, are outstanding that are still being discussed. So I think there'll be a better opportunity to answer that question uh, once we have ratification. Uh, we are at tables with other uh, unions at, concurrently with the BCGEU. Uh, the fact that they have lifted their pickets, the fact that um, uh, the strike situation is, is, uh, is certainly uh, suspended, if not uh, uh, taken down completely. I, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, wordsmiths to figure that out. It's, uh, I haven't been given the, the exact uh, wording. I do know that uh, we'll be back to work. The hospitality sector will have uh, access to uh, the products that they need to continue to, uh, to bounce back from COVID. So, uh, but uh, what I can say is that we had a mandate uh, that we put in place uh, through uh, Treasury Board internally. Again, these are more of the hows than the whys. But uh, how we propose to continue to have one of the strongest economies in the country is to make sure that we're paying wages that, again, uh, there's not a person that uh, is going to benefit from the negotiations that we're embarking on right now in the public sector that won't be spending the bulk of that money in their neighborhoods or in this community. There's not going to be a lot of tax havens uh, popping up as a result of these deals. It's about people delivering services for their neighbors. And that's uh, what we set out to do. Uh, we set out to do it within a framework, and uh, I'm confident we'll be able to keep within that as we go through the other uh, sectors that are going to be bargaining over the next number of months. Katie, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, and you know there was obviously a, a, a teaser to the inflation relief yesterday with announcements for for schools and um, you know, meal programs. But can you give us a, a preview of you know is, is there a rebate coming to uh, British Columbians and, and any preview of inflation relief measures? Uh, I'll leave that to the Minister of Finance, uh, who will be available to you at uh, later today to talk about public accounts. Uh, uh, she would be the better person to ask that question. I tasked her with doing that work. It's well underway. It's near completion. Uh, Minister Whiteside announced a significant portion of that uh, $60 million to, again, to be uh, administered by school districts who have a better sense and understanding of the kids in their classrooms and what their needs are. These are the types of initiatives that Michael spoke about, and I know uh, I see so many uh, uh, council members from and mayors from Port Coquitlam and Coquitlam. The way we make progress, uh, KD, is by working together and finding the best way to meet the challenges uh, of members in our community. So uh, Minister Robinson can get into more specifics, but I wouldn't characterize yesterday as a teaser. I would characterize that as providing uh, uh, for families as they prepare for the school year, which is always... Uh, Although I've married off my uh, oldest son, I remember full well the, the late August, early September crush of, 
uh, new jeans, a new pair of go fasters because his feet were growing and, uh, and a whole bunch of other expenses. So this is a tough time for families. We wanted to make sure that they knew that help was on the way and there'll be more coming in the days and weeks ahead. Next question is from Sophie Chavas, CBC Radio Canada. Yes, hello, hi. Uh, my question is for the Education Minister to have an, uh, an answer maybe in English and in French, if it's possible. Uh, the BC Teacher Federation is talking about the severe teacher shortage, actually, um, especially like in rural communities. And I would like to know, is there like any plan from the government to solve this issue? And also to reply to some parents that are worrying about uh, the school start and the COVID-19 uh, cases increasing. Sure. Thank, thanks very much. Just with respect to uh, with respect to teachers, we've been working very closely with our partners across uh, across the system, with districts, uh, looking at uh, looking at the teacher supply. We know that there are some rural areas that are facing particular challenges, and we're working very closely with those districts, particularly in the in the uh, in the north, uh, and developing some plans to uh, to support uh, a recruitment uh, in in those communities. Um, I think we know generally, though, we have labor force press pressures uh, across all sectors and those are issues that uh, again we are uh, we are, are, are discussing with our with our partners with districts uh, with educators to uh, look at the measures that we will need to be putting in place to ensure that we are that we're keeping up with uh, uh, with the recruitment needs as we see enro enrollment um, uh, increasing across our K-12 system uh, with respect to uh, to COVID measures again um, We've, uh, we've released our, our education uh, guidance to, to districts and uh, as we have done since the beginning of the pandemic, we follow the advice of our uh, public health officials and the measures that are in place, the guidance that is in place um, uh, for next week and for the coming school year looks very much like uh, what uh, was in place when kids finished off the, the last school year. You'll recall that uh, there were some changes after spring break and uh, so things will be very familiar when, um, when kids go back to school. I will say, however, However, it is still very important for staff and students to do their daily health assessment and to not come to school uh, uh, if you're sick. That's for students and staff. Just don't don't come. You have to stay home if you're uh, if you're sick. And uh, we know that with regard to vaccinations, there are opportunities for uh, parents to get vaccination, uh, not only for uh, for the five to 11 year olds, but also now for uh, six months to five years. And we really encourage parents to seek out whatever information and opportunities they need in order to um, to increase those those vaccine rates. Those are those are going to be that's going to be important going forward. Next question is from Brianna Charlebois, Canadian Press. Oh, hi there. This is for Premier Corgan. Um, I'm just wondering if you could you know, provide a comment or reaction to the infant death this weekend in Barrier due to the lack of ambulance services. Um, I'm hoping you can speak to that specific incident, but also more generally to the overall trend of the province and how the government is planning to respond to mitigate this. Well, thank you very much for the, the question. And first of all, of course, uh, uh, my heart goes out to the family who are grieving at the loss of a child. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a tragedy that none of us uh, ever want to imagine, and yet it's happened uh, to a family in Barrier. Uh, I know the ambulance service is doing a review. Uh, I'll certainly wait for uh, the feedback from the community on the details around this uh, uh, youngster and the, and the family and how they've been affected. But the broader question, uh, one of the things we did during the COVID pandemic was a, a significant investment in rural and remote uh, ambulance services, not just um, on the ground, but also fixed wing and other uh, ways to get people out of rural and remote communities using uh, airplanes and helicopters. So we've been conscious of the challenge. We've been increasing the number of ambulance paramedics across the province. We're working with firefighters and the uh, BC uh, Paramedics Union to find ways to ensure that first responders uh, have the training that they need so that when they get to a site they can act quickly, uh, whether they're there as firefighters or they're there as ambulance paramedics. But uh, these are extraordinarily challenging times and I, I don't want to sound like a, a broken record, but it is sector by sector by sector. We do not have enough people to provide the services that British Columbians have come to expect. And the only way to do that is to train more. The only way to do that is to encourage some people uh, to carry on uh, working beyond when they would like to, 
so that we can continue to provide these services. Um, we have been engaged in discussions with the federal government, as I said earlier, on the Canada Health Transfer, but also on putting in place a human resource strategy that is tied to an immigration plan that reboots and reimagines how we uh, deal with immigration. Uh, I'm the son of an immigrant. Uh, Canada was built uh, on Indigenous territory by successive waves of people from around the world, and that time is upon us yet again. And we need a national strategy, and that's why it's so important that all orders of government and all people who put their name forward to uh, represent their communities understand that they can't do it by themselves. They have to do it in collaboration and cooperation, regardless of political stripe, regardless of region. Canada, as, a, as an entity, requires collaboration and cooperation, and we need the federal government to understand that uh, more critically, I believe, than they do today. Brianna, do you have a follow-up? I do, yes, thanks. Um, Econ 911 is also calling for more financial support for their call takers, citing burnout and staff shortages, um, and just in light of the current funds running, expiring next month. Um, so I'm wondering if you have a specific reaction to this and um, whether that's something you're considering. Well, we're, uh, we are uh, at the bargaining table with uh, hundreds of thousands of public sector employees. Uh, 911 uh, dispatchers are part and parcel of that. Uh, so again, uh, collective bargaining is underway uh, in uh, all areas of, uh, of service delivery, and I have every expectation that uh, bargaining will be hard and we'll get to a conclusion that meets the needs of the public who have to pay for it, but also the public who benefit from those services. We have time for one more question. Rob Buffum, CTV Victoria. Oh, hi, Premier. Thank you for taking my call. It relates to health care, and it relates specifically to a drug that um, helps people with cystic fibrosis that has been approved um, for public funding in every province and every territory in Canada except for BC. I'm just in the parking lot of uh, Vic General Hospital about to speak to a, a woman and her 10-year-old daughter who has cystic fibrosis. who are frustrated that BC is dragging its feet. Um, as I said, every other province and territory has now approved it, Health Canada has approved it. I don't know if you're familiar with this drug, but I wonder if you have a message for this, you know, family as well as others who have children between the ages of 6 and 12 waiting for this drug to be approved that is supposed to be very helpful. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Rob, for the question. I apologize. I won't be able to give you a substantive answer, but I know Minister Dix would be available or certainly through the Ministry of Health uh, or VHA, you can get an answer. I would suggest the Ministry of Health and the minister on uh, where this fits in uh, approval processes within British Columbia. We have uh, professionals, uh, healthcare providers that uh, work with the materials they get from Health Canada. Uh, they collaborate with other jurisdictions uh, to come to these conclusions. So I, I don't want to uh, give misinformation to that question. I will say that the family, though, as I do to all families who are struggling with health challenges, I had my own personal challenge in the past number of months. Uh, that uh, the system is not uh, fractured, it's in crisis. And the people that provide the services, uh, nurses, doctors, uh, care aides, the whole continuum of people from the admissions desk at the front of the uh, acute care facility uh, to those who manage our files uh, in, uh, in primary health care clinics across the province are working uh, like daylights to make sure that, that we are safe and well. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, you can get a resolution through this uh, intervention today, Rob, for this family. Uh, but the best place to do that is with the Minister of Health. Rob, do you have a follow-up? Um, sure, yeah. I, I, get, I wonder if you could even speak in general terms about the, the process here in BC for approving drugs for rare diseases. The family and others advocating for them have said, our system is too bureaucratic, there's too much red tape here in BC, which is what's slowing down the process here. Uh, can you comment on whether you think the process needs in broad strokes to be reviewed or revised? Well, again, uh, the person that's best at, uh, suited to answer that question is Minister Dix. Uh, Rob, uh, I apologize for uh, not uh, trying to fabricate an answer that will meet your story. I just can't do it. Uh, I'm not aware of a bureaucratic obstacle. So I know our system is not dissimilar to others across the country, and it is predicated on Health Canada leading the way. So, uh, again, I, I, I regret that I'm not able to uh, fill a space for your story, but I'm confident Minister Dix will be able to do that. That's all the time we have for questions. Thanks, everyone, for and joining I'll, us. And I'll just say that my cool water is tepid tea right now, so <laughs> I'm going to get out of the sun. But thanks, everybody, for coming. It's good to see you again. After all.
All the announcements were made. There was an opportunity for a brief meet and greet for many of those who were instrumental in pushing for a second school to be opened in the region. Later in the afternoon, Mr. Horgan attended a luncheon that was held at Finn Donnelly's constituency office. This was another opportunity for a quick meet and greet with many of our community leaders. Mr. Horgan's last stop of the day was the Hoy Creek Housing Cooperative, where he had an opportunity to meet both residents and the construction crew that are responsible for a rebuild that will allow them to maintain affordable housing in Coquitlam for the future. 